of the Sovereignty of God by Arthur A. W. Pink, narrated by David Clark. Introduction. Who is regulating affairs on this earth today? God or the devil? That God reigns supreme in heaven is generally conceded. That he does so over the world is almost universally denied, if not directly, then indirectly. More and more are men in their philosophizing and theorizing, relegating God to the background. Take the material realm. Not only is it denied that God created everything by personal and direct action, but few believe that he has any immediate concern in regulating the works of his own hands. Everything is supposed to be ordered according to the impersonal and abstract laws of nature. Thus is the Creator banished from his own creation. Therefore we need not be surprised that men in their degrading conceptions exclude him from the realm of human affairs. Throughout Christendom, with an almost negligible exception, the theory is held that man is a free agent and therefore lord of his fortunes and the determiner of his destiny. That Satan is to be blamed for much of the evil which is in the world is freely affirmed by those who, though having so much to say about the responsibility of man, often deny their own responsibility by attributing to the devil what in fact proceeds from their own evil hands. Mark 7, 21 to 23. But who is regulating the affairs on the earth today? God or the devil? Attempt to take a serious comprehensive view of the world. What a scene of confusion and chaos confronts us on every side. Sin is rampant, lawlessness abounds, evil men and seducers waxing worse and worse. 2 Timothy 3.13 Today, everything appears to be out of joint. Thrones are cracking and tottering. Ancient dynasties are being overturned. Democracies are revolting. Civilization is a demonstrated failure. Half of Christendom was but recently locked together in a death grip. And now that the Titanic conflict is over, instead of the world having been made safe for democracy, we have discovered that democracy is very unsafe for the world. Unrest, discontent, lawlessness are rife everywhere and none can say how soon another great war will be set in motion. Statesmen are perplexed and staggered. Men's hearts are failing them for fear and for looking after those things that are coming upon the earth. Luke 21, 26. Do these things look as though God had full control? But let us confine our attention to the religious realm. After 19 centuries of gospel preaching, Christ is still despised and rejected of men. Where still he the Christ of Scripture, is proclaimed and magnified by very few. In the majority of modern pulpits, he is dishonoured and disowned. Despite frantic efforts to attract the crowds, the majority of the churches are being emptied rather than filled. And what of the great masses of non-churchgoers? In the light of scriptures, we are compelled to believe that the many are on the broad road that leadeth to destruction, and only a few on the narrow way that leadeth unto life. Many are declaring that Christianity is a failure, and despair is setting on many faces. Not a few of the Lord's own people are bewildered, and their faith is being severely tried. And what of God? Does he not see and hear? Is he impotent or indifferent? A number of those who are regarded as great leaders of Christian thought told us that God could not help becoming the late awful war and that he was unable to bring about its termination. It was said and said openly that conditions were beyond God's control. 
to these things look as though God were ruling the world? Who is regulating the affairs on the earth today? God or the devil? What impression is being made upon the minds of these men of the world who occasionally attend a gospel service? What other conceptions formed by those who hear even those preachers who are counted as orthodox? Is it not that a disappointed God is the one whom Christians believe in? From what is heard from the average evangelist today, is not any serious hearer obliged to conclude that he professes to represent God who is filled with benevolent intentions, yet unable to carry them out, that he is earnestly desirous of blessing men, but that they will not let him? Then must not the average hearer draw the inference that the devil has gained the upper hand and that God is to be pitied rather than blamed? But does not everything seem to show that the devil has far more to do with the affairs of earth than God has? Ah, it all depends upon whether we are walking by faith or walking by sight. Are your thoughts, my reader, concerning this world and God's relation to it based upon what you see? Face this question seriously and honestly, and if you are a Christian, you will most probably have cause to bow your head with shame and sorrow and to acknowledge that it is so. Alas, in reality, we walk very little by faith. But what does walking by faith signify? It means that our thoughts are formed, our actions regulated, our lives moulded by the Holy Scriptures. For faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10, 17. It is from the word of truth and that alone that we can learn what is God's relation to this world. Who is regulating affairs on this earth today? God or the devil? What saith the scriptures? Ere we consider the direct reply to this query, let it be said that the scriptures predicted just what we now see and hear. The prophecy of Jude is in course of fulfilment. It would lead us to far astray from our present inquiry to fully amplify this assertion but what we have particularly in mind is a sentence in verse 8 likewise also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh despise dominion speak evil of dignities yes they speak evil of the divine dignity the only potentate and king of kings and lord of lords ours is a peculiarly an age of irreverence and as the consequence the spirit of lawlessness which brokes no restraint and which is desirous of casting off everything which interferes with the free course of self-will is rapidly engulfing the earth like some great giant tidal wave the members of the rising generation are the most flagrant offenders and in the decay and disappearing of parental authority we have the certain precursor of the abolition of civil authority. Therefore, in view of the growing disrespect for human law and the refusal to render honour to whom honour is due, we need not be surprised that the recognition of the majesty and authority of the sovereignty of the almighty lawgiver should recede more and more into the background, and the masses have less and less patience with those who insist upon them and conditions will not improve instead the more sure word of prophecy makes known to us that they will grow worse and worse nor do we expect to be able to stem the tide it has already risen much too high for that all we can now hope to do is warn our fellow saints against the spirit of the age and thus seek to counteract its baneful influence upon them. Who is regulating affairs on this earth today, God or the devil? What saith the scripture? If we believe their plain and positive declaration, no room is left for uncertainty. They affirm again and again that God is on the throne of the universe, that the scepter is in his hands, that he is directing all things after the counsel of his own will 
they affirm not only that God created all things, but also that God is ruling and reigning over the works of his hands. They affirm that God is the Almighty, that his will is irreversible, that he is absolute sovereign in every realm of all his various dominions. And surely it must be so. Only two alternatives are possible. God must either rule or be ruled, sway or swayed, accomplish his own will or be thwarted by his creatures, accepting the fact that he is the Almighty, is the Most High, the only potentate and King of Kings, vested with perfect wisdom and illimitable power, and the conclusion is irresistible, that he must be God in fact, as well as in name. It is in view with what we have briefly referred to above that we say present day conditions call loudly for a new examination and new presentation of God's omnipotency, God's sufficiency, God's sovereignty. From every pulpit in the land it needs to be thundered forth that God still lives, that God still observes, that God still reigns. Faith is now in the crucible. It is being tested by fire, and there is no fixed and sufficient resting place for the heart and mind but in the throne of God. What is needed now is never before is a full positive, constructive setting forth of the Godhood of God. Drastic diseases call for drastic remedies. People are weary of platitudes and mere generalisations. The call is for something definite and specific. Soothing syrup may serve peevish children, but an iron tonic is better suited for adults, and we know of nothing which is more calculated to infuse spiritual vigour into the frames than a scriptural apprehension of the full character of God. It is written that the people that know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Daniel 11:32. Without a doubt, a world crisis is at hand, and everywhere men are alarmed. But God is not. He is never taken by surprise. It is no unexpected emergency which now confronts him. For he is the one who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Ephesians 1.11 Hence, though the world is panic-stricken, the word to the believer is, Fear not. All things are subject to his immediate control. All things are moving in accord with his eternal purpose and therefore all things are working together for good to them that love God and to them that are called according to his purpose. It must be so for of him and through him and to him are all things. Romans 11:36. Yet how little is this realised today even by the people of God Many suppose that he is little more than a far distant spectator, taking no immediate hand in the affairs of earth. It is true that man is endowed with power, but God is all-powerful. It is true that speaking generally, the material world is regulated by law, but behind the law is the lawgiver and law administrator. Man is but the creature, God is the creator, and endless ages before him first saw the light, the mighty God, Isaiah 9, 6, existed, and ere the world was founded, made his plans, and being infinite in power, the man only infinite, his purpose and plan cannot be withstood or thwarted by the creatures of his own hands. We readily acknowledge that life is a profound problem, and that we are surrounded by mystery on every side. But we are not like the beasts of the field, ignorant of their origin and unconscious of what is before them. No, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, of which it is said, Ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in dark places, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your heart. 2 Peter 1.19 and it is to this word of prophecy we indeed do well to take heed to that word which has not its origin in the mind of man, but in the mind of God. For the prophecy came not at any time by the will of man, 
but by holy men of God who spake and were moved by the Holy Spirit. We say again, it is to this word we do well to take heed. As we turn to this word and are instructed thereout, we discover a fundamental principle which must be applied to every problem. Instead of beginning with man and his word and working backwards, back to God, we must begin with God and work down to man. In the beginning God, apply this principle to the present situation. Begin with the world as it is today and try and work back to God and everything will seem to show that God has no connection with the world at all. But begin with God and work down to the world, the light, much light is cast on the problem because God is holy, his anger burns against sin because God is righteous, his judgments fall upon those who rebel against him because God is faithful, the solemn threatenings of his word are fulfilled because God is omnipotent, none can successfully resist him, still less overthrow his counsel and because God is omniscient, no problem can master him and no difficulty baffle his wisdom. It is just because God is who he is and what he is that we are now beholding on the earth what we do. The beginning of his outpoured judgments in view of his inflexible justice and immaculate holiness we cannot expect anything other than what is now spread before our eyes. Let it be said very emphatically that the heart can only rest upon and enjoy the blessed truth of the absolute sovereignty of God as faith is in exercise. Faith is ever occupied with God. That is the character of it. That is what differentiates it from intelligent theology. Faith endures as seeing him who is invisible. Hebrews 11:27 endures the disappointments, the hardships, the heartaches of life by recognises that all comes from the hand of him who is too wise to err and too loving to be unkind. But so long as we are occupied with any other object than God himself, there will be neither rest for the heart nor peace for the mind. But when we receive all that enters into our lives as from his hands, then no matter what may be our circumstances, our surroundings, whether in a hovel a prison dungeon or a martyr's stake, we shall be enabled to say, The lines are fallen unto me in pleasant places. Psalm 16, 6. But this is the language of faith, not of sight or of sense. But if instead of bowing to the testimony of Holy Writ, if instead of walking by faith, we follow the evidence of our eyes and reason therefrom, we shall fall into a quagmire of virtual atheism. Or, if we are regulated by the opinions of the views of others, peace will be at an end. Granted that there is much in this world of sin and suffering which appalls and saddens us, granted that there is much in the providential dealings of God which startle and stagger us, that is no reason why we should not unite with the unbelieving world and say, if I were God, I would not allow this, or tolerate it, that, etc. Better far, in the presence of bewildering mystery, to say that one of old, I was dumb, I opened not my mouth, because thou didst it. Psalm 39, 9. Scripture tells us that God's judgments are unsearchable, and his ways past finding out. Romans 11:33. It must be so if faith is to be tested, confidence in his wisdom and righteousness strengthened and submission to his holy will fostered. Here is the fundamental principle between the man of faith and the man of unbelief. The unbeliever is of the world, judges everything by the worldly standards, views life from a standpoint of time and sense and weighs everything in the balance of his own carnal making. But the man of faith brings it to God, looks at everything from his standpoint, estimates values by spiritual standards and views life in the light of eternity. Doing this, he receives whatever comes as from the hand of God. Doing this, his heart is calm, 
in the midst of the storm. Doing this, he rejoices in hope of the glory of God. In these opening paragraphs, we have indicated the lines of thought followed out in this book. Our first postulate is that because God is God, he does as he pleases, only as he pleases, always as he pleases, that his great concern is the accomplishment of his own pleasure and promotion of his own glory, that he is supreme, the supreme being and therefore sovereign of the universe. Starting with this postulate, we have contemplated the exercise of God's sovereignty, first in creation, second in governmental administration over the works of his hands, third in the salvation of his own elect, fourth in the reprobation of wicked, and fifth in operation upon that within men. Next, we have viewed the sovereignty of God as it relates to the human will, in particular human responsibility in general, and have sought to show what is the only becoming attitude for the creature to take in view of the majesty of the Creator? A separate chapter has been set apart for the consideration of some of the difficulties which are involved and to answering the questions which are likely to be raised in the minds of our readers. Whilst one chapter has been devoted to a more careful yet brief examination of God's sovereignty in relation to prayer, Finally, we have sought to show the sovereignty of God is a truth revealed to us in Scripture for the comfort of our hearts and to strengthen our souls and the blessing of our lives. A due apprehension of God's sovereignty promotes a spirit of worship, provides an incentive to practical godliness and inspires zeal in service. It is deeply humbling in the human heart, but in proportion to the degree that it brings man into the dust before his maker, and that extent is God glorified. We are well aware that what we have written is in open opposition to much of the teaching that is current both in religious literature and in the representative pulpits of the land. We fully grant that the postulate of God's sovereignty with all his corollaries is at direct variance with the opinions and thoughts of the natural man. But the truth is, we are quite unable to think upon these matters. We are incompetent for forming a proper estimate of God's character and ways, and it is because of this that God has given us a revelation of his mind. And in that revelation, he plainly declares, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. In view of this scripture, it is only to be expected that much of the con contents of the Bible conflicts with the sentiments of the carnal mind, which is at enmity with God. Our appeal then is not to the popular beliefs of the day, nor to the creeds of churches, but to the law and testimony of Jehovah. All that we ask for is an impartial and attentive examination of what we have written and that made prayerfully in the light and lamp of truth. May the reader heed the divine admonition to prove all things, hold fast that which is good. 1 Thessalonians 5, 21, 18.